Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for enhancing the use of person-centered language in your long-term care home. My name is Holly Hebner. I'm a project coordinator with the Ontario Centres for Learning, Research and Innovation in Long-Term Care, hosted at the Research Institute for Aging, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. This webinar is brought to you by the Ontario CLRI program that strengthens quality of life and care for residents across the province. We do this by providing education and training, sharing research and innovations, identifying and developing resources for long-term care homes. The program partners with the long-term care sector and aims to provide solutions for priority issues, including an aging population, increasing care complexity, and workforce excellence. We are funded by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Long-Term Care and hosted at three different sites, Baycrest Health Sciences, Briere, and the Schlegel UW Research Institute for Aging. Our presenters today are Kate Ducek, Project Officer with the Ontario CLRI hosted at the RIA, and Tina Kalviainen, Human Resource Leader and Strategic Communications Specialist with the Behavioral Supports Ontario Provincial Coordinating Office hosted at the North Bay Regional Health Centre. Kate and Tina did a webinar with Brain Exchange earlier this year that gave an overview of how to use the Person-Centered Language Toolkit report that was developed by BSO, the Ontario CLRI at RIA, Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, the Person-Centered Language Expert Panel, and other partners. Today's webinar will share more stories and strategies for using person-centered language in your long-term care community. I hope you'll all stay with us to the end of the webinar. We have a survey for you to fill out about your webinar experience, and you'll have an opportunity to tell us what, you, what you'd like to learn about in future webinars. Before we get started, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples whose land we are fortunate to be on. We're glad to have Kate and Tina with us to share more about person-centered language, why it matters, and fun ways to start the initiatives in our homes, and I'll turn it over to them now. All right, thanks very much, Holly. This is Kate speaking, and thanks to you all out there for joining us today. Tina and I are really glad to have you participating with us in this webinar topic that we're very passionate about and really enjoy discussing. So as you can see on the screen here, our webinar has three learning objectives. Each of them are about 15 minutes long each, so you know where we're going. And to also make it easy for you to review parts of the webinar later, and as well for other people who aren't able to join us yet or haven't seen it yet, to watch the webinar in its uh, three different pieces at another point in time. And so the first part of our webinar is about understanding the importance of person-centered language when interacting with residents, team members, and family members in your long-term care home or care community. And now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Tina to get us uh, started off with a fun activity. Hi. Um, we decided to start things off with an activity, and uh, we kindly ask that you participate by joining our poll, either um, by web or by text and uh, our collective answers will create a word cloud in the Poll Everywhere software. Uh, for those of you texting answers, we ask that you start a new text message and put the five digit code, which is 37607, and you need to type in Tina K684, and you can find this number on the right hand side of the slide. For those of you responding via the web, you can type in pollev.com forward slash Tina K684, or you can go to poolev.com and then type in uh, Tina K684 as detailed on the left-hand side, side of the slide. And now I will turn it over to Kate that will lead us through um, the first two uh, questions. All right, thank you, Tina. So the uh, first question we have for you is, what do you think of when you hear the word unit? So what kinds of words, images, feelings, actions, and responses come to mind? So when you hear or think of the word uh, unit, just type them in there on your cell phone or on your computer. And it looks like we have some popping up already, which is fantastic. And I think uh, for people who keep putting in the uh, same word, those are the words that show up in this uh, evolving word, word cloud here uh, in really large. So it looks like hospital is a main one. Got people saying uh, department, measurement, institution, group, unit, segregated, cohesive, community, cubicle. Yep, because the word unit, it can have a uh, 
lot of uh, different meanings and depending on how you interpret the word uh, sterile long term army cold yep and i think there's uh, organization and collaboration up there so uh yeah so lots of uh, really great responses and then for the uh second part of uh this uh, word cloud activity we want to know what comes to mind when you hear the word neighborhood so what kinds of images, feelings, words, actions, or you know, gut uh, feelings or responses come to mind when you hear the word neighborhood? And again, it looks like uh, a fair amount of people are putting in the word community. There's also town, warmth, support, belonging, connection, Mr. Rogers, yep, and, it's, and especially with that uh, movie out now, that's actually what I thought too when we uh, had, had this pop up. I'll just give people a, a couple more seconds here and people are also putting uh, some responses in the uh, questions box which is fantastic i've been reading out uh, some of those as well yep and uh, some of the other ones on the screen are protected and identity sesame street yep so so ha having all those uh, warm fuzzy feelings and so i think uh, what we're able to uh, agree here with the the, the word community is that uh, you know not only what we say and how it's how we say it uh, matters. And um, I noticed that uh, you know with some of the words that were uh, coming up, some of the words that reflected the word unit, which can be uh, done to correlate where somebody lives in long-term care, as I think uh, long-term care and most of our healthcare systems come from the the the, the more acute care or uh, hospital model. And, and so just some of those things, you know, that can be, you know, very systematic because we definitely need people who are in and out of the hospital in a timely manner. As uh, you know, for the most part, though, things have been changing in recent years. People aren't always in the hospital for a matter of uh, hours or days or on a fixed schedule. But when we consider long-term care, which is where people live, and it's not just a place where we happen to, to work, that it really is someone's home. And so that, uh, We've been trying to encourage people to use the word neighborhood as people have uh, different rooms, different things that they treasure, um, different stories and uh, things that they have, have had happen to them in the past. And as well as uh, things that have, uh, you know, been coming up now and as well toward, toward their life for the coming years in, in the uh, future. And uh, just something else to uh, get people uh, thinking and started with our uh, webinar is, is that we have a uh, poll question. And so we wanted to know your thoughts on how much of our communication with other people happens through nonverbal ways, such as through body language, facial expressions, hand gestures, and touch. And so the poll should be uh, popping up on your screen there. So yeah, um, how much of communication happens through nonverbal ways? Do you think it's 10%? 30%, 50%, 70%, or 90%. And so we will uh, give everybody uh, just a few seconds here to keep putting in uh, your responses. I really like what you said, Kate, about how changing our word from unit to neighborhood and how everyone has um, you know, their own home where things that they tre treasure and um, their own experiences. And when I think of the word unit, I always think of um, one. And you know, it kind of homogenizes everyone who lives on uh, or in a long-term care home or you know, on a certain floor. So I think neighborhood uh, makes everyone reflect on how everyone there is different because we all know that we live with different people in our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all definitely. Right, so I'm going to close the poll here and then we'll share the uh, results. And it looks like um, we had a small portion of people say that 30% of our um, communication is through nonverbal um, means. Um, the next was 50% of our communication uh, through nonverbal communication, and then 70% uh, and then 90%. So, uh, which is it, Kate? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it looks like a lot of you uh, got the answer right. So the correct answer, and I, honestly, I would have guessed uh, only 30% until I'd done some reading on this topic. The correct answer is, is that 90% of our communication with other people is nonverbal. So the way that we look, how we carry ourselves, the expression on our face, and how we move our body. So yeah, keeping that in mind, when you think about it, only 10% of our communication is verbal, even though most of us tend to 
think that what that what we are saying is what our main message is. All right, and now we're going to uh, move into one of our videos. So we just wanted to uh, give everyone just a, a second to watch this video with Dr. Al Power, and it has uh, insights on the effects that our words have on us and on other people. And uh, Dr. Power, his full bio is is on the slide there, but he's the uh, Schlegel Chair in Aging and in, in, in Dementia and Innovation, among other things. And uh, yeah, like I said, you'll be able to read his full bio in the PDF slides and the handouts there. So why is our choice of words so important? Well, our language partly reflects our own mindset and views and attitudes, but it also can help set our mindset and set the mindset of those with whom we are communicating. This can be very significant when it comes to the care and support of people living with dementia. Much of the language we are using, unfortunately, remains very stigmatizing, very, non, very judgmental, and even blaming of the person for their words and actions. When this happens, this gives us a negative diminishing view of the person, and it actually blinds us to all the many other factors outside of brain disease, such as relational or operational or historical factors in the living environment that may be contributing to a person's words and actions. As a result, we are blinded to more innovative solutions, and we don't see anything outside of medical treatment, which is why we have gotten so much trouble with potentially dangerous psychoactive medications. When we see the person as more of an equal, when we use language that is non-stigmatizing, then we are actually able to be open-minded to what the many different factors are that could be affecting a person's well-being. Another reason why we want to use the proper language is because it not only affects our thinking, but that in turn affects our nonverbal uh, communication. People with dementia, particularly those who have difficulty accessing memories or our understanding language will be extremely sensitive to nonverbal communication. And if we approach a person with a certain mindset that judges them, that may show in our body language, and that may in fact create a sense of us being disapproving of the person, which may then lead to a negative interaction. So once again, this can affect the quality of the care we provide or, or our other uh, medical care professionals provide if we use language that sets people's minds in a certain way before they approach a person. Okay, so we hope that everyone had a chance to listen to uh, Dr. Power's wisdom on uh, how our words affect us and other people. And so now we're gonna share a quote from Kate Swaffer who is a person living with dementia who co-organizes and leads the world's largest dementia advocacy group by, for, and with people living with dementia. She aptly notes, the language of dementia is changing or evolving into one that is more acceptable to people with dementia. It may well be the key to a more person-centered approach to care and the key to reducing shame and stigma. And so uh, BSO and partner organizations heeded the call uh, to action that has been requested by Kate Swaffer and other people living with dementia many times in recent decades. The Alzheimer's Society of Ontario was instrumental in mobilizing BSO to take on a lead role in highlighting the importance of person-centered language. The BSO Provincial Coordinating Office united multiple organizations to assemble an expert panel, which included both Kate and I as leads as the person-centered language initiative uh, along with Gagan Gill, a former program and policy analyst with the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. Pictured in this slide are the expert panel members that gathered at an in-person and online video conference um, meeting that was organized in the fall of 2017. The panel included representation from various sectors, including individuals and their care partners uh, that kept us grounded in the important uh, lived experience. The group's purpose was to encourage the use of appropriate, respectful, life-affirming, and inclusive language when talking with and referring to those that we serve and care for. Moving on into why do we need person-centered language? And so by reflecting on our language choices and putting person-centered language into practice, everyone can play a supportive role in reducing and eliminating barriers associated with stigma and discrimination, stereotypes, labels, and prejudices, misunderstandings and misconceptions, feelings of shame, guilt, 
fear and distress, social isolation, negative, inaccurate, and misleading portrayals across society. To counter that, we hope that person-centered language uh, could potentially increase the likelihood of individuals sharing personhood facts and symptoms being experienced, pursuing a timely diagnosis and support, leveraging strengths and abilities, living at home and staying involved in the community and at work as long as possible, participation in research, an increase in quality of life and well-being, better understanding through education, promoting, celebrating positive views in mass media, and being able to engage in discussions around health promotion and prevention, such as the Fountain of Health, um, which is actually a national initiative uh, that promotes health behaviors in all Canadians. And now we're on to uh, part two of our webinar with the goal of increasing your use of person-centered language by engaging in self-reflection exercises. And this is uh, where we have a, uh, another video with uh, Dr. Al Power. It's more than just a matter of changing language, however. Words do reflect an underlying mindset. And so whenever we talk about language, as you will today, we need to talk about what are the underlying assumptions and values that lie behind those words? And how can we change those assumptions and values to help us support better language? Simply changing a word because it seems politically correct is not going to help anybody if we don't change the mindset. Words develop what is called pejoration, where over time they can develop the same stigmatizing flavor as the words that were used before them because people's mindsets don't change as quickly as words change. We've seen language change in other aspects of medical care. Back in the 1960s, words like idiocy or morons were used to describe people, and then the term mental retardation was introduced because this was felt to be much more um, humanizing than those terms. And that lasted for a long time, but since 2010, the term intellectual disability has been pre preferred because once again, the word mental retardation has been deemed offensive to people living with intellectual disabilities. I will say to you, knowing all the people I know who advocate living with dementia, terms like demented or a dementia sufferer are very offensive terms, and we have all the same obligation to stop using language that is dehumanizing to the people that we are purporting to support. So building on what uh, Dr. Power had uh, said in his videos, we're gonna do a couple of interactive case studies. So case A is about an aggressive long-term care resident. And so the situation is, is that you are reviewing the resident's care plan before going into their room in the One East unit to provide care, engage them in an activity, do an assessment or something along those lines that is related to your role as a team member or as a leader in long-term care. So you read in the uh, person's chart that uh, they're known to be an aggressive resident who is extremely demanding and resistive to care, especially in the dining room. And it's challenging to get her to take her medications and for the resident to leave her room. You also notice written there is that she is usually aggressive verbally and physically when attempts to in to in interact with her are made. So having read or heard this, what are your physical, emotional, and mental reactions to this? How will what you are feeling and thinking right now affect your approach with this person? So just uh, type in whatever comes to mind in the questions box on the right hand side of your screen. You might have to click on the little arrow next to where it says questions to get that box to open. Yeah, so again, just uh, let us know after uh, hearing or reading on the, the screen this uh, case study A, what, uh, what types of things are you feeling in your body? What types of things are going through your head? And uh, yeah, what are you feeling emotionally? Do you want me to chime in with what people are saying now? Sure, that'd be okay, great. great. Um, so some people are, I'm seeing apprehension coming up quite a bit, um, uh, being, feeling uh, afraid or scared. And um, oh goodness, they're going so quickly. Um, reluctance to see the individual. And uh, someone said this type of language may increase fear and or apprehension for staff when interacting. 
Um, some people are feeling tense. Some people are saying, how can I make this more, uh, my time with the resident more enjoyable? Um, so a little bit of problem solving and proactivity on that end, which I really, really appreciate. Um, feelings of self-doubt. Um, someone said it's quite a biased assessment of the resident. Someone said confident, and they're quite used to seeing this type of uh, communication. Sorry. Yeah, it seems like, yeah, there's uh, various feelings, and I, you know, felt a lot of the same things when I first uh, read it over. Yeah, you, just that you have a sense of, all right, so what am I supposed to do? I'm feeling a little bit scared, definitely feeling tense, and that, uh, yeah, that it definitely seems like it's going to be uh, some type of battle, and yeah, what is the best way to approach this? So now I'll uh, hand it over to Tina to take us through case B. And so case B is uh, about a long-term care resident uh, communicating via personal expressions, responsive behaviors. And so you're reviewing Alma's care plan before going into her room in the Pine Hill neighborhood to do something related to your role as a team member or leader in long-term care. Alma lives with vascular dementia and lung disease and tends to keep to herself. You read there are times when you approach Alma She'll politely uh, decline and gently taps your hand. But when you come back later, Alma will be more accepting, um, will accept what you invite her to do or take. It has also been noted that Alma sometimes will wince and scream, um, ouch, when you touch her left arm. And she'll reach out to hold onto your arm for a moment when you do this. Additionally, Alma often asks to go back to bed right after dinner, and if she waits for a long time, her breathing looks uncomfortable and she will call out, please bed, bed please, repeatedly. Once Alma is settled in bed, she usually relaxes and stops calling out. And so in this scenario, um, we're looking to, we're asking the same questions. Um, what are you feeling? What are your physical, emotional, um, mental reactions to this scenario? Um, and how will what you're feeling and thinking now affect your approach to care? And so if you wouldn't mind uh, typing in the question boxes again, that would be lovely. And so this scenario here. Um, so Tina, I'll just let you know what people are saying. Um, someone's saying, they feel confident in how they would uh, proceed with care and also have feelings of concern for the pain that the resident is experiencing. Um, compassion, empathy, uh, much more informed. The challenges are evident, but they advise what works for the uh, resident. Comfortable, prepared, confident, um, gentle approaches. And those are all excellent um, mm -hmm. answers. And so we were hoping that, you know, by making and taking the time to describe the unique circumstances, um, that hopefully it does provide clarity and confidence in that approach. And so the language being more specific and objective, um, hopefully does facilitate a better understanding of what's happening. And so, believe it or not, um, both cases, A and B, are the same person living in long-term care, um, experiencing the same situation. And so the difference here was how the person was perceived by you based on what you read in her care plan. And so the team member who would have documented Alma's care plan in case B used a person-centered approach, whereas um, the team member in case A uh, did not. And so um, we'd like to take a moment to thank Mario Tsukas, who is a psychogeriatric research consultant in the Toronto area, for sharing this case study um, for us to be able to share along uh, with you. Uh, unfortunately, the um, worksheet uh, was not included in the handout. That's included in the right side of the box, but we, because we didn't want to ruin the surprise. And so uh, it'll definitely be uh, attached um, to the, um, the link to the, the archived webinar. Uh, and so it will uh, be avail made available to you. Um, so thanks again to Mario for providing us with this case study. And so at this uh, point, we're gonna move into our, um, 
are commitment statements, are persons that are language commitment statements. And in case you aren't aware, there are several self-reflection questions for your consideration that are um, part of the persons that are language toolkit that was uh, released last fall. And in it are reflection questions for each of the following commitment statements um, in order to engage in a deeper conversation. And uh, we also welcome for you to uh, come up with your own uh, self-reflection questions as well. Uh, a link to the toolkit will be uh, provided in upcoming slides, and uh, you can also find the toolkit by Googling BSO person-centered language. And so the first commitment statement is to see the person first. I will focus on the person's holistic well-being by respecting the role of culture and other influences such as personal experiences and the environment. Okay, and person-centered uh, language commitment statement number two is building trusting relationships. And uh, we can do this by being open and compassionate about each person's unique experiences and establishing a trusting relationship by honoring what matters to them and to their care partners. And then commitment statement number three is to consider all forms of communication and we're able to do this by developing a strong understanding of the person's health conditions and consider verbal and nonverbal means of communication, such as, uh, you know, whether we want to um, identify those means of communications by referring to them as responsive behaviors or per or per smell expressions and the person's body language to be forms of meaningful communication. And then uh, our fourth and uh, final commitment statement is to advocate for person-centered language. And we're able to do this by continuously reflecting on and advocating for person-centered language and its potential impacts. We can do this by being open to discussion regarding language choices for ourselves and for others and to respectfully challenge those that are not person-centered and to celebrate positive language choices. So later in this webinar, in just a few slides coming up, we're, we will be sharing a few strategies with you to give you options for how to respectfully and effectively challenge word choices that uh, aren't person-centered. And uh, likewise, as, as Tina had said, that uh, we have some uh, self-reflection questions in our toolkit report that's up on the screen here with the uh, link. Other options for raising awareness about uh, person-centered language is in it, like the posters and our pledge certificate. And uh, as well, we're going to be sharing some success stories from other long-term care homes in Ontario and uh, a few resources we come across so, so that you're able to put per person-centered language in, in practice in all of your long-term care homes and your care communities. So now we're moving into the uh, third and last part of our webinar where you will learn strategies to enhance and sustain the use of person-centered language in your long-term care home or care community. And uh, as you might know that we have person-centered language commitment statement posters. These were created based on feedback from our expert panel. And uh, so the first version on the left, version one, it's the uh, full version with all of the supportive and actionable text. Version two on the uh, right, it is um, the more graphics folk. Uh, focused version and is, it still has the uh, action statements and you know this is just something for whether um, whether people wanted to print it at a smaller size to, to post up or, or, or for people that just find that the images resonate much more strongly with, with them than having the additional text. And uh, as you can see here, so we have the uh, posters as well as the pledge certificate available in both official languages. And we encourage you to uh, take the online pledge, doing it on your own as a team, as uh, part of a uh, whole home. And uh, so when you do complete the online pledge, you have the option to generate a PDF version of it, similar to the one shown on your screen here. So you're able to do that, save it, print it, to, to proudly display it or to keep it on file. And uh, taking the pledge is uh, really easy. You just go to BSO's pledge website. So you can Google BSO, person-centered language, 
and as well, it's shown on the slide here that you'll have the hyperlink version of in the uh, PDF handouts on the side of your screen that will also add to our website that we'll, we will email you with to follow up with all of the resources and webinar recording. So you can just put in your first and last name, or if you're doing it as a uh, team, you can put in your team's name there and just to, uh, you know, just jig it however you want in the uh, text boxes, or you're able to put your long-term care home or health or, or healthcare group's name. And uh, so speaking of pledges, the uh, BSO Provincial Coordinating Office received this heartwarming photo of people who are taking the pledge at the 8th Annual North Simcoe Muskoka Dementia Care Conference. And it was really nice that they, uh, as you're able to see, took the pledge together with their hands over their hearts, demonstrating that their person-centered language movement had, had begun. And uh, some really great quotes that uh, was shared from Erie St. Clair's BSO Qualitative Stories. One, the top one there by Henry Ford, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is a success. And uh, by an unknown author, there was a great quote as well, teamwork divides the task and small uh, to applies the success. And you'll be hearing more about the uh, team at uh, Erie St. Clair in just a minute. Now we're going to share a few success stories about long-term care homes and BSO teams that have been spreading the word about person-centered language, starting with uh, Central West BSO team. Uh, Teresa and fellow team members integrated person-centered person language into their hiring practices by updating job descriptions and interview questions. They've created a new therapeutic recreation program uh, by using a PCL lens. They've reviewed and updated documentation, templates, and assessment tools by considering the following question. Is there a more person-centered way to say this to guide pur purposeful reflection, documentation, and discussion during the review and on a go-forward basis? Informal team leaders influenced others and encouraged a spirit of self-reflection. And formal leaders modeled person-centered language as well during conversations with other leaders and team members. Um, person-centered language posters were posted on office doors to uh, display their commitment and show their support and, uh, and encouraging others to do, to do the same and post the posters in their um, shared spaces. Some of their successes, successes have included um, the uh, act of actively self-reflecting by stopping mid-sentence, pausing and rephrasing, um, and then respectfully uh, correcting one another, such as by whispering, we don't use that word aggressive anymore. Um, lessons learned did include the importance of modeling um, being vulnerable and in allowing others to see your own self-reflections and learning, adopting a no-shaming or blaming approach, and starting small and being persistent, recognizing that each conversation is important. And so next steps for this team includes um, creating new programs uh, using a person-centered language lens from the outset, which is really exciting. On the topic of advocating for person-centered language, um, part of it does include that respectfully challenging language choices that are not so person-centered. And so we recently come across a concept and thought we'd share with you today on the um, concept of calling in versus calling out. Um, calling out typically involves an individual publicly pointing out that another individual has written uh, or said something that may not be so person-centered. Uh, whereas calling in invites an individual to have a personal conversation in private. By recognizing that we are not perfect and offering compassion and patience, the act of calling in can be a powerful tool to create a safe space for change to occur and holding each other accountable by positively influencing each other to be better as we grow together on this journey of person-centered language. It makes me think of Central West's example of whispering, you know, we don't use that word aggressive anymore, which appears to be a bit of a blend of both calling in and calling out, which demonstrates that things aren't always clearly defined and that there are multiple ways of respectfully challenging language choices that are not person-centered. Wonderful, thanks, Tina. 
So next up is the inspiring success story from Windham Manor, which is in the Mississauga Halton area about how they put person centered language in uh, to practice. So their team's approach included creating a worksheet after they watched our person centered language matters webinar earlier this year and they also looked over our slides from it and all of them decided to take the online pledge and uh, print and post their certificates. They also reviewed the practical resources that's uh, listed in our person-centered language toolkit report, which were the most useful resources that were suggested by the expert panel we worked with. Uh, they also facilitated an in-service on each long-term care neighborhood as a way of supporting all, all team members to complete their home's person-centered language worksheet they made. And as well, they completed care observations of residents who tended to communicate via responsive behaviors or personal expressions where the in-home BSO team suspected maybe a lack of person-centered language or lack of person-centered care might have been a, a factor affecting the residents' expressions. So some of the uh, key supporting factors that the uh, Wintam Manor team noted were that they used excellence in resident-centered care or ERCC and as well as the gentle persuasive approaches to dementia care training programs. It helped that, the, that their home's BSO lead is also part of the home's leadership team. So that way they had ongoing positive communication and planning both, both between the uh, BSO team and the leadership team to pave, pave the way for successfully changing their uh, practices and language. And some other things that their uh, team did is that they always engage with uh, family members prior to residents moving in. So just to get to know people a bit more and to make them feel welcome. And as well, they have a very strong presence in the neighborhoods and the team is also involved with providing care. So they have a really good sense of, you know, what is going on in, in the homes are able to be there to mentor, to mentor, to coach people, you know, to, to uh, step in, to get anything done when it comes up. And so they're really always willing to support team members and residents. And the pictures we have at the bottom of the screen here are Wyndham Manor's BSO message boards that they use to get out the word about person-centered uh, language. And so some of the uh, positive communication strategies at uh, Wyndham Manor is uh, that they found that they had an improved focus on person-centered care after uh, undertaking this activity. Um, they found that there was more awareness of how person-centered language and person-centered care are reflected not only in each person's word choices, but as well as in people's uh, tone of voice and their non-verbal means of communication. They found that uh, more and more people on the team were using person-centered language in their documentation and in their charting practices. There was greater self-awareness and insight into how each team member's behavior can influence the, the uh, the actions of people living there. They found that team members were actively lis um, listening to residents more. And they also noted that there was a reduction in per in uh, personal expressions or responsive behaviors that, uh, as they found out, improved residents' home life since the long-term care home really is their home. And it also increased team members' job satisfaction. So it was a win-win experience for everyone. And, uh, you know, just with any undertaking or activity, there's always lessons learned and new insights to learn from. So at Wyndham Manor, they found that providing team members with positive feedback by using just a small few words of thanks and praise made a really big difference. And as well, you know, they noted that person-centered language, that it's not just about words, but it's also about actions. So that's where reflecting, changing your words and practices, and being aware of your nonverbal communication is so important. And uh, some of the next steps that they're working on is that person-centered language is now going to be included in their orientation day as part of their BSO in, uh, in uh, introduction for new team members. And so uh, next up is uh, Erie St. Clair's uh, Stendicare to come as a long-term care home where they put person-centered language in action. And so in June this year, the team embarked on a four-week project with a focus on educating staff on uh, person-centered language to enhance knowledge and skills in, in providing the best care possible. 
So one of the things that they hoped for was to obtain 30% of team member commitment pledges. So, so they had a goal of 30%. They used some uh, you know, knowledge translation tools, such as suggested words and phrases that they placed at people's workstations to try to enhance their accessibility, as well as the visibility of these words in hopes that more people would start using them. And their new uh, employee orientation handouts, like the one shown on this uh, screen here, has been revised to include more about person-centered language. And so some of the uh, successes for this team and their next steps is that their internal BSO team that they had hoped for a uh, goal of 30%, uh, but they managed to exceed their goal with 40%, 45% rather, of various team members completing the person-centered language commitment statements. They heard from a variety of uh, you know, team members from all of the departments across the home, even volunteers. And to help to promote the and increase the commitment to person-centered language, that the team has a dedicated communication board, one of which is uh, shown on the slide here, the middle picture. And so they're gonna use that for BSO rewards and recognitions, and as a means of praising and highlighting the positive examples of person-centered language used by team members. And as well on the uh, left-hand side of the uh, photo here on the slide, that uh, the team designed a uh, poster that uh, they then got printed with all the hands in the middle and they encouraged every, everyone, all the team members to sign it. So just showing, uh, just another way of showing that it, it's, it's their commitment to using person-centered language. And so by posting it in the home, it serves as a nice reminder of their commitment to use their knowledge and skills to provide the best care possible for the people who are living in their homes, the people that they serve. And so um, moving along to uh, person-centered language, we're going to talk about the REACH rewards and recognition. Uh, we hosted the webinar via our Brin Exchange partners in February, um, which had attendees from uh, six provinces, and it has been archived and has now reached uh, over 725 views, which we're really excited about. Um, and so if you have time, we welcome you to, to view that one as well, which gives a bit more background. Uh, into the initiative. Following the webinar, uh, there was also a poster challenge whereby the coveted person-centered language uh, poster uh, was provided in exchange for individuals sharing their actions um, the, to implement and spread person-centered language within their communities and organizations. And so over 70 individuals completed the, um, the survey as part of the poster challenge. And uh, outside of Ontario, our posters traveled all the way to BC, Alberta, Manitoba, and Nova Scotia. As of the end of November, we have reached over 1,700 uh, online pledges which we want to take an opportunity to celebrate with you and hope that that number will continue to climb. And as for the conference circuit, uh, we most recently presented at the Canadian Academy of Geriatric Psychiatry and Canadian Coalition for Seniors Mental Health in Alberta. Earlier the, and uh, earlier this fall, we also completed a workshop submission for the Advantage Ontario Convention, which takes place in the spring. All right, thanks, Tina. And some of uh, the, our next steps that we have uh, planned or that we're working on already for our person-centered language work that we're so happy to be sharing with you all is to develop our first person-centered language e-learning module that we're going to have released and freely available for anybody to use it by the end of March next year. And in the meantime, we are creating person-centered language guidelines template with practical suggestions and options. So that way you can select the terms and phrases that work best in your care home. And we were really hoping to have it done in time for today's webinar, and we're still um, getting the final version of it done, but we promise you that it will be worth the wait. And as part of uh, person-centered language commitment statement four about the uh, concept of celebrating positive language choices, the pin on the left hand side of your screen here was created as a uh, tool to get in the habit of appreciating as well as recognizing the great work when it comes to positive language choices. And so we hope that, you know, the, this pin that you can put on your lanyards and its speech bubble shape, that it'll help be a conversation starter and a way to continue the spread of conversations about using person-centered language. So be sure to stay tuned for more rewards and recognition for helping to get the word about person-centered language out there.
We wanted to take a moment to highlight that some of the implementation stories that were shared today um, have surfaced from success stories that have been um, submitted through uh, quarterly reporting through the Provincial Coordinating Office and also through BSO's Knowledge to Practice Community of Practice. And so uh, a community of practice is a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. And so should you wish to share and learn from others as to the work that they are doing within the knowledge to practice process framework, which we've adopted, uh, and it was developed by Dr. David Ryan and his colleagues. Um, if you're looking to engage in discussions about your own work and lessons learned, uh, then please consider accepting our invitation to join our community of practice. The web meetings take place uh, from 9 to 10 on the third Thursdays uh, of January, April, June, September, and November with our upcoming uh, meeting scheduled for January 16th. And so if the community of practice is something that's of interest, uh, then we welcome you to complete the survey that is, um, um, the link is indicated at the bottom of the slide there. And should you wish to learn more information, we've added a link as well on the uh, right-hand side of the slide. Okay, and now we're gonna hand it over to you all to let us know if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for us. So this could be about uh, anything that uh, Tina and I talked about during the webinar today. If you wanna share what you find works in your long-term care home for helping to uh, change people's minds, hearts, speech, speech and actions about person-centered language, and as well, what you would like us to work on next. So anything that could be a useful resource or a tool for you. And we'll give uh, people a minute or so there. And uh, while you're all thinking away, maybe talking away if you're watching the webinar as a group or typing your responses in, I just wanted to give everybody a friendly reminder for those of you joining us from Ontario Long-Term Care Homes to be sure to apply for our uh, free training in backfill support if you haven't already. Just the other week, the Ontario CLRI announced that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Long-Term Care reviewed funding for the PSW Education Fund and the Communication at End of Life Fund for Long-Term Care. So applications for this uh, tuition and backfill for these great training funds are open now, in, including uh, the one the PSW Fund was about, the Excellence in Resident-Centered Care we mentioned in our webinar. And new this year for the PSW Education Fund is that trainers can now teach all team members, so not just people who uh, work as PSWs, and that uh, we do this in partnership with Conestoga College here at the uh, RIA, and that, uh, yeah, that, that Breer has a really great team that are working on their communication at the end of life training fund that is available in both English and French. So be sure to check out these websites. They're in the uh, PDF with uh, linked in the handouts on the right-hand side of your screen, and get in touch with the uh, people there for any questions you might have. And so now back to any questions that you have for us. All right, so the first question that came in is, where will the e-learning modules be available? So the e-learning module, it's uh, going to be available online. So all people have to do is just uh, fill out a uh, really brief registration form for it, and then you're able to access it online. So it's not gonna be anything that is going to be comp that's going to be comp uh, comp uh, located um, Tina and I are making sure that uh, we're just uh, finalizing uh, which vendor is going to be developing the e-learning e e e modules for us so, so we want to make sure that all people have to do is just get on click you know type in just uh, you know just a little bit about how we're able to get in touch with you and then you're able to access it that way. And so we're still, and so and so we haven't finalized what the uh, URL or what the exact web website for the online learning is going to be just yet. Because that's something else that's dependent on uh, who the lucky person is that we end up moving uh, forward with to develop our e-learning. So be sure to stay tuned for to the Ontario CLRI e-newsletter and as well as to BSO's e-newsletter. E and um, yeah, you, you you will find out as soon as the uh, person-centered language online learning is available through them. And um, is there a document that shows language not to use um, versus what is better to use? Yeah, actually that's um, what we're calling the uh, person-centered language guideline templates that we're developing and very close to uh, finalizing. It's something, you know, to make it uh, 
very accessible and easy for everyone to use. And as well, we need to make sure that it's available in uh, AODA format. So that way it meets the uh, province's standards for persons living with disabilities. That um, it's going to have some suggestions pulled from some of the uh, most practical and common resources that uh, are listed in our person-centered language toolkit report. We're just pulling them out to make it e even easier for people to find and use. And we're going to have a uh, column on the template that's fillable. So whether your home is already, you know, using some words that you prefer, like I know in some long-term care homes, they refer to people living there as residents. Some homes call them clients if that's what the people prefer. And even at some homes, they refer to the people living there as neighbors since, you know, they're all living in the same area in the same city or town or village. So, so you know, in some cases that, uh, you know, Tina and I can't say, you know, for sure one way that there is one best word or one best phrase to use for certain things. So that's why we're going to pull out uh, some of the most well-used options that, that we know other people have used, like our expert panel, which was a range of people across various healthcare groups and uh, many people with lived experience. So we're going to pull those out, put them together, and then we're also going to have a fill in, fill in the blanks column for, for you to pick either some of those words or phrases or whether there's a better word or phrase that uh, you and your care home are, are using now and, and, and plan to keep using. And I think you said it earlier, um, the warm fuzzy feelings are what we're going for, not words that make us feel um, sad or um, discriminated against or just a general not good feeling. We're looking for the warm fuzzies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because some of the words, you know, and some of the clinical words that, you know, they can be short and easy to use and, you know, easy to write down, kind of like we saw with uh, case A and case B. But uh, as we know, language, you know, it's constantly evolving over time. It can change day to day. And so, yeah, just trying to, you know, just try to reframe our thinking that in long-term care, people can be there for a very long time, or at least typically longer than uh, people are living in, uh, in, in, in the hospitals and such. So those type of, uh, you know, care communities where people are there for months and years, just, yeah, just trying to reframe our thinking and wording, even though we've seen it for years and decades, just putting that little spin on it can really have a great effect on, you know, how we see the people who are in our care, the other people we, and, and the other people we, we work with even. All right. And uh, someone asked, how do we support staff who are overwhelmed by heavy workloads to be less stressed and can use more uh, person-centered language more often? Yeah, I think there's, uh, you know, definitely opportunities for that. And, uh, you know, Tina, you uh, can chime in here. Um, after me as well, because like, I know you have some really great uh, thoughts on this topic and I've heard from a lot of people in homes across the province and different healthcare sectors that, you know, and this is something where we're trying to do with the webinar, trying to break, break it up into, you know, small chunks because we know that team members don't have an hour at, 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 at most times to step away from their important roles to do training. So if all you have is, you know, five or 10 or 15 minutes to, to do some training, whether it's, you know, just whatever fits best with people's schedule, whether it's in response to, you know, maybe uh, something that had come up, that it's uh, an option to support people. And even if it's during like, you know, team huddles or, you know, during, during some of the, uh, the uh, shifting changes. So just as a way for people to keep in mind, you know, that it is important that it can help reframe, you know, how we can get uh, stuck that, you know, it seems to be human nature that we tend to be drawn more torn toward the, uh, negative and you know can get stuck focusing on it versus it takes more work to try to focus on the positive elements the great work you're doing you know the difference it makes in people's lives even those little things by making sure the person's really warm or they have their sweat sweater buttoned up they're all tucked in for bed or to have a nap or to have the muffin that that they really like and I, I really wanted to emphasize the the overwhelming piece with with workload. Um, one of the comments that had been made when we were comparing the case studies, you would have noticed that in case B, which was more person centered, it would have been more detailed. And so that investment of time, however, um, you know, really clarified and was able to give a clearer picture of you know the scenario of what was happening, of what person centered care would look like for this individual. And so. There were some efficiencies there, and so it's it's about it may seem like certain things such as documentation, which is a, a really wonderful um, place to intervene and to be able to infuse person-centered language, 
um, that in, in the end it, it can, um, you know, promote person-centered care and, uh, and create efficiencies in, in the, like as part of the bigger picture. So really wanting to emphasize that. And really, if you're, you know, in certain terms or labels, um, you know, selecting something else um, doesn't take much longer. Um, and so it is definitely doable. And that's what we found with person-centered language is that, you know, by the numbers indicated by those who are attending today, um, you know, there is interest. Uh, there's wanting to be able to, to create a, a better work environment, a better living space for individuals and, and the care that we provide. And so, you know, access to language is something that is within our control and can definitely have a positive impact. Yeah, and building on what Tina said and, you know, some of the responses that came up to the uh, two case studies we were chatting about is that, you know, even though even though case study A was much shorter, that it's easier to, you know, type or write into somebody's chart. But with case B, it just gave a lot more background to the person, where the person's coming from and their needs. So even though case A, you know, doing that, uh, you know, short type of uh, charting on somebody, you know, that, 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 that it, on the one hand, it's beneficial to save time, but with case B, that that might end up saving you as well as some other team members time and as well as, you know, maybe some possible frust frustration from the resident or their family members about, you know, that, that, that they have somebody who knows what the best approach is to, to use with them to keep in, you know, some of their, uh, personhood elements and facts. So yeah, so there's a flip side to thinking, yes, you know, healthcare, we are driven to do things as quickly as possible, but then, you know, sometimes taking a bit more time up front to, you know, change your words, add a little bit more to what you're charting about the person could uh, save a lot more time and, and as well as save uh, tension and stress and burnout, both on the team end and, and for the people living in our homes. Yeah, and uh, just to add to what uh, both you and Tina are saying, um, I think there's an opportunity to um, make person-centered language um, a game within your long-term care home. So I know Tina spoke to calling out versus calling in. Um, you can spin that the opposite way and say, you know, I'm going to call someone out when they're doing something good. And then, uh, I don't know, create some sort of reward system within your own team. And um, you know, that could be publicly displayed. And, and so instead of calling someone out when they're um, not saying something that's person-centered, um, calling someone out so that everyone else around knows, wow, that person's doing a really, really great job. And uh, I'm mindful of time now. So Tina and Kate, if you don't have anything um, else to um, comment on, um, I'm happy to start our wrap up. All right, sounds good. Okay, so I wanna thank the both of you for spending the afternoon with us. Um, but I think everyone is leaving with some great strategies to move forward. And I want to remind everyone that we've recorded the webinar and it will be posted on the Ontario CLRI website along with the resource handouts um, for you to download. And um, everyone who registered for the webinar will receive an email notifying you when it's available. And uh, this is our last webinar of 2019. So I'd like to wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season. And we hope, uh, hope we can connect with you again in the new year. So uh, please check out our website for upcoming events in 2020. And you can also subscribe to our e-newsletter. So uh, thanks very much for joining us today and uh, have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone.